our speaker this week I bumped into about a month ago. Uh, and I think by my calculation, I've managed to get in three words edgewise whenever we've spoken. So I'm really looking forward to uh, our speaker today, Dominic J.P. Nelson Ashley. And I'm looking forward to the story that he has to share and the experiences that he's been through. So I'll hand things over to you, Dominic. Thank you. Okay, can you all hear me clearly? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right, so uh, first of all, I know time is limited. So why should you listen to me? That's the first thing. Right, so I have been an award-winning social entrepreneur. I've mentored people who's uh, uh, been homeless and mentored people who've got off drugs. I've mentored people mm -hmm. who have won the Mercury Music Prize. Uh, been X Factor finalists. Um, I be, I've taught in South Africa. I've done a lot of things. So I thought to myself, okay, how can I start off this session? I've been thinking about this for ever since Basil invited me. I just I've been every morning. I've been waking up thinking, how can I start this? How can I get the message across? Right. And then on my birthday on the 18th of March, right. I was looking through Facebook and I saw this um, post and it was about this bird that is so rare, it's forgotten its own song. So you might have seen that, I can't remember the name of the bird, but it is so rare that, you know, you know, there's so much distance between it and its other like-minded people that it's forgotten how, it's, how to sing its own song. And it got me thinking like most of us are probably living in the karaoke version of our, of our true selves. By that, I mean the message that we give ourselves in our head all the time is not clear and concise. Is the, is the message that is in your own head, is it clear or is it muffled or, or and bathed in echo and not clear? So what, one of the things that I do, right, is that at different state, and this changes, is that I have a mission statement Right, a per, for uh, I've had mission statements for the businesses that I've run, but I have a personal mission statement, and that has changed at different times of my life. Right, so if you have a mission statement, you'll find this like it'll always keep you focused on the prize, whatever that prize is, and that's an individual. That's down to the individual. So you know, at one stage, my mission statement was to you know my children. Be all and end all, right there, you know. And, but now they're older now, you know, they're both at university, you know, the, the primary mission statement that I have is different. And also the other thing is to have three key words for yourself. You don't have to share them with anybody, right? That, because the easiest way to put this is that you have to, this might sound a bit weird, you have to market yourself to yourself. Now that might sound strange. Let me explain this to you, right? So, black person, right? So if I turn on the internet and I'm doing research and I type in good hair, it's not gonna come up with hair like mine. It's gonna come out with blonde, blue eyes, etc. Yeah, I type in bad hair, it's gonna come out with dreadlocks. That's a fact, right? As a black person, the, the imagery and the information that I get bombarded with on a subliminal level is negative. So how do I combat that? I have to combat that, right? Because it's an active thing. If we don't think about it, then you know, that's how you go like, oh, why am I feeling down today? Oh, you've been on the internet too much. Oh, you've been on the internet. And like, what's happened? I've looked through this and like, the subliminal messages from the media, etc. So how do you combat that? You have to combat that by, you have your own personal mission statement as a constant reminder, right? You have your key words for you that will constantly, that if you have them running around in your head, that's the, you have to insulate yourself to some degree. You have to, because this is the, remember you're surrounded by this stuff all the time. And if you, and if you don't actively combat it, it will seep into you and knock you down. And also you've got to remember that the people you meet, 
right? Because they 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 get these messages as well. Will have that imp have the media's impression of you before you even walk through the door. As a black person, how many times you heard like, "Oh, you don't sound black." You're different to every other black person I've ever met or or or, or, or expecting. Oh, I thought all black people were late. Yeah, that's that's the real thing. So you know, and also if you think about it, right? So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer, right? I'm a writer. So the general perception is like, oh, black people don't read, right? Oh, there is no market for black people. But the main thing is, there's no market for black writers, right? But there's there's but if you if you think just in this small paradigm, right? Just think UK, you're just like, oh, there's only like 3% of the population's black, da, 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 you know, we're in the minority. That, but as soon as you start thinking globally, there's more black people in the world than white people. So that's another thing, it's like your, your, the, your horizons, everybody's horizons might, is probably smaller than it should be. The easiest way to describe this, right? Okay, Star Wars, everybody see the Star Wars film or heard of Star Wars. Star Wars started as an idea, somebody drawing out a piece of paper, write down, oh, this would be a good idea. And look at it now, multi-million, multi-billion pound franchise. So, you know, so everybody's idea and perceptions is probably smaller than it's possibly to be. So that's the first thing I want to say, right? Okay. Second thing. Um, what is the second thing I wanted to say? Right. Okay. Business people, right? Now, as I said, I've been, I've, you know, run various businesses, been on the boards of various businesses. I've been a careers advisor. I've, I've you know, I've, seen i've been to lots of hr departments seen lots of ways i've done interviews for um top level businesses and low level business to get people in right now as a as a freelancer right i've been a freelancer for like 30 plus years right i have never been in a situation where they've gone right all right we haven't got much money we'll pay you a little bit this time and next time we'll pay you more. When you go back, oh, we paid you that. We paid you a certain price last time. But it's never, it never goes up. It never goes up. And the other thing is, small businesses, by the nature of their, their being small, yeah, sometimes I found there is that, there's, there's not been a separ enough of a separation between um, the personal and the business. So if you want to do business with somebody, it's like, oh, you get you, you can get hold of them quite easily. Da, 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 da. And so negotiation becomes a problem. And if you want chase, chasing the money, that has been a problem because there is that personal relationship. So this is a thing that I was taught on um, by, by several different, I heard this from several different business leaders. If you're a small business, then you need to have somebody who handles the, um, the invoicing side. And that, that can be a real person or an imaginary person. And I, this act, I, I actually actually use this technique because I had, uh, I was contracted to, to do some work for somebody. Um, I said, I said what I agreed with them, what the price was, right? Or organized the payment strategy. Then they started not sticking to the payment strategy. So then even though I, at this particular moment, I run everything, right? I then had, I then wrote to them and said like, oh, I've got person X now handling the payment side and I'm just working on the creative side, right? And there was a change in attitude. Did I get my money? Yes, I did. Did I get it quicker? Yes, I did. 
So sometimes, you know, and so, so that comes back to the marketing perception thing. Okay, there's a perception out there. You know, what you put out to the world is how people will perceive you. And there's also what they expect from the media. Yeah, so if they see you, okay, you're one, you're, you're one person. Okay, okay, then I'll be, you know, it's just them, I get on with them. Okay, I can push the boundaries. Okay, but if they see there is that clear demarcation, then it's a different, you can have different conversations. And that reminds me whilst we're here. So uh, this is a, the literature I got about this particular organization, it says it's not for profit. In my experience, that is a, um, that is a tagline that does not work because people see not for profit, they see cheap. They see uh, free. So when I, the social, the, 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 not, the community interest companies that I've been involved with, we've, we've never, we've removed, we moved away from the not-for-profit tag. We just call it a social enterprise. This is all down to perception again. Yeah? Okay. Um, right, the other thing, what says, um, yes. We are all on our own individual journeys. Because we're all, we're all, we are all individuals. No, no two people are the same, right? So um, even twins are different. You see two twins. I saw, the, I saw the TV the other day. There was these doctors and they're twins. They're both doctors, right? But you know, they're twins, but you could see, they see there's differences between them. Yeah, so we are all individuals. So your particular route to success or what you deem as success is not necessarily gonna be the same as somebody else's. So this all comes back to um, the key things of, I said it at the very beginning, having your own personal mission statement, right? So which also ties into, okay, what personal and professional outcome do you want? Yeah, because that's it, everybody is different. And it's going to change over, might change over time depending on, you know, what you've got going on. But you have an outcome, but your, your, your particular route there is going to be different. Okay. Okay. What else do I want to cover? I feel like I'm talking a lot. I'm just talking. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> I've, uh, I've got a question. So you said your, your mission statement has changed. Yeah. Uh, depending on where you are in your life. Yeah. So uh, if you think back to when you were living in Ashton under Lyme. Yeah. <laughs> what was your mission statement then and how has it changed to what it is now? Right. When I, when I was living in Ashton under Lyme, that was my first job as a careers advisor. So in 1992, um, I, I was unemployed for about a year. Yeah, um, I'd left the a job, a job I'd had was, I was trained to be a tax inspector um, and decided it wasn't for me for a variety of reasons. So I left that um, and so I was unemployed um, and then uh, I became um, a careers advisor because uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine and he said, I, the stuff I was spouting out, it's not sort of like the stuff I'm spouting out now, he said I sounded exactly like his mum. I said, what does your mum do? She's a careers advisor. So I was fortunate enough that at that particular time, if you got onto a course, the number of, the number of places, the number of jobs available around the country was equal to number of uh, places on a course. So if you got to onto a course and you passed the course, you were guaranteed a job as long as you were prepared to go anywhere. So the first job I got was Ashton Underline. It rained all the time. <laughs> so my mission, my mission statement was to stay warm. <laughs> no, my, my mission statement was to, um, at that time, was to solidify myself within the industry. So because it was a case of, it was careers advice at that particular time, it was, it was, it was a new thing. 
it was a relatively new thing. It was like had a bit of psychology, uh, you know, a bit of mentoring, a bit of this, a bit of sociology, all thrown into, into one, one thing. So at that time, so my, my mission statement, my personal mission statement then was to um, solidify myself within the industry. So I ended up moving out of Ashton Underline further north uh, to the Middlesbrough area because my girlfriend at the time was living um, in the north. She'd, um, she'd retrained from being a systems analyst to doing, physio, becoming a phys doing physiotherapy. And uh, yeah, she hassled the career service in her area so much that uh, <laughs> they invited me for an interview, but it's the worst interview I've ever done. They gave me a job. And so we got married and I'm still here. <laughs> so yeah, at that particular time, it was just to solidify myself within the industry. So um, later, which actually, this ties me on to um, talk about the mission statement and knowing your worth. This ties into knowing your worth. So as I say, careers advisor in, in the Northeast. I, um, because I have, a, I, one of the other things I do is music. Um, I would do careers advice during the day. And in the evenings, I teach music production and songwriting to disadvantaged young people. Um, so what happened is that within the um, career service, I got known as the person who was um, into the creative side of things. So throughout the, throughout the whole area, if anybody was interested in the creative arts, they're passing through to me. You know, so because you know, most things, most a lot of jobs, engineering, etc. There is a there is a dedicated pathway. But if you're in the creative arts, you have to design the pathway yourself because the nature of creativity is very an individual thing. So, you know, this ties into like the outcome that you want is a different, everybody's different. Everybody's got different skills, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, so my thing was because I was the, create, the creative person, um, the, the job I then had was re-engaging the disengaged creatively. So my, the last job I had at the career service was like the 50 toughest young people, you know, the ones who smoked all day, wouldn't get out of bed. Um, they, my job was to re-engage them. Um, so what I did, because um, it was close to Christmas, I hired out a nightclub, uh, pulled in a favor from a, um, a DJ that I used to work with called DJ Spoonie. Um, so he, 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 did, he performed at a, a cut price. I contacted all the police, so there, was, so, and, um, so there was no trouble. And you could only get a ticket for the main event at Christmas if you, from a youth club. So um, attendances at youth clubs went through the roof. Um, the kids had somewhere to go at Christmas. Um, so everybody was happy. Um, and the, we had a budget, and this was, this, how long ago was this? This was about, oh, this is over 10 years ago. Yeah, more than 10, maybe 15. I can't remember now. Um, anyway, we had a budget of like 15 grand, right? So we had more kids than expected to turn up. So at the very last minute, I drafted in more staff, more careers advisors. We went over budget by 150 pound. So everybody was happy everybody except not my boss not their boss the boss's boss going like oh went over by 150 pounds how come so it was an alcohol free bar it was in the contract there were no alcohols to be served so this 150 pounds was for soft drinks because we had more suddenly we had more staff because we had more young people to up the top brass refused to believe that there were uh, that the additional staff were not drinking alcohol, All right? So my boss believed me, da, 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 da. boss's boss believed me, but the top brass were not having it. So to cut a long story short, right? 
I was so annoyed, right? Um, oh, the other thing is that in the when the when the um, this great event that I spent over a year planning, when it was in the paper, somebody else got the credit, right? So there was two things that really pissed me off. Pardon my French. So that Christmas, I went to Africa for the first time because my cousin was getting married. So I went to Sierra Leone, where my dad's from. So, and when I was there, I saw that all my side of the family over there, right, were, um, were like entrepreneurs and doing things, right? Um, and I bumped into, I was, I, one, once upon, I was out on the street, and this guy came up to me. He said, you want to change money, right, or whatever. And he just had a little card with his name on it. And he said, entrepreneur, right? And I just came back and I just thought, in Sierra Leone, they've got next to nothing. And everybody was doing great things. So I came back and I packed the job in and set up my first social enterprise. Now, when I said this is about knowing your worth, right? I was paid a salary. Within the first 10 weeks of setting up that social enterprise, the amount of money that I made was equivalent to a year's salary. Because my specialism was re-engaging the disengaged. So yeah, so that's where, that was one of the first times I go like, oh, actually, I've been undervaluing myself. Okay, next question. So um, what I'm really impressed by on your resume is the fact that you publish poetry. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the story around that, the subjects and the topics you've addressed and the successes that you've had in that particular field? Right, okay, well, um, I was, um, as I say, I'm a musician. I used to have a recording studio um, and I ended up recording an album of two poets uh, called Bob Begri and Andy Willoughby. And they so have to be lecturers at Teesside University, creative writing. And they persuaded me that'd be a really good idea for me to do the course. So I did that, but these two are fantastic poets. So I just thought, no, there's no way that I'd ever be able to touch, get to that level. You know, that's the programming I told myself because I, I hadn't seen somebody doing what I do in that format. Um, so what happened is that my son was, um, in his first year of university, he got glandular fever. So he got, so his weight got really, he got, he got thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, but he just kept taking this, um, you know, medication because he said like, if he, if he, if he dropped out the first year, you know, coming back would be hard enough to repeat again. So he really got thinner and thinner, but he, he powered through. Um, and he had his tonsils removed and all sorts of stuff. He was in and out of hospital. Um, but you see, he was 18, like he got thinner and thinner and thinner. So in the summer holidays, uh, his mum and um, his sister went off on holiday and I stayed with him. Now, he got thinner and thinner and thinner and it triggered, it triggered me because when um, I got, when one of my cousins was 18, he killed himself. So I could see my son getting thinner and thinner and thinner, right? And it's just triggered like, okay, when my, my cousin was 18, he, he committed suicide. So I wrote, first poetry collection I wrote uh, was called Original Soundtrack. And it was all about how to, how I managed to get from being, you know, a teenager 
all the way to being the person I am, you know, a couple of years ago when I was 50. So that's what that, that, that whole book was inspired by um, that spending time with my son, just the two of us, whilst, you know, rest of the family were on holiday, et cetera. So it was just me and him just like bonding, just talking, you know, playing computer games or whatever, you know, I had gigs to go to, which I didn't go to. It was just me talking, I just like, I wrote it about two weeks. Um, so, and I stuck, and I stuck my face on the cover. <laughs> And then um, the one after that was called String Theory. It's about male mental health. Um, because the area I live in, it has the highest um, incidence of male suicide. Um, and also, as I said, my, my cousin committed suicide. Um, and I thought, well, and I, there's a lot of people I knew who've had like mental health issues. So what I did is I collected all those stories put it in a poetic poetic forms and um, didn't mention any names or anything like that. And I just put it in a collection and people have found it really uh, beneficial. That's where the, um, you know, the, I sent you a, Basil, I sent you a link to that poem called Rant. That's what that, it comes out of that string theory collection about male mental health. And that poem is, which is, is it goes down really well every time I perform it and people have written to me about it, say they, they really like it. Um, it's really helped them. And it's basically saying that, you know, that you are fantastic. You know, that, you know, okay, you're at the starting, you know, you're trying to say that, okay, you want to get to point Z and you're at the starting position, but your starting position, you know, because you haven't had things, you know, that everybody else has had, you're just like, you're starting from a further point back. So in real terms, you're probably running faster than Usain Bolt. And so that when you wake up in the morning, you've got to tell yourself that you're fantastic. Anybody who tells you isn't, you just got to ignore them, you know. And you know, people also talked about, you know, that if people tell you, which I found is like, you tell somebody that they're fantastic, they'll go like, oh, you know, you're just saying that because you know me. But so the other while, the premise talk about like, okay, well, send your information, take your name off it, and send it to somebody who don't know you. And then when you break it down, like, you know, my, my name's not Dominic or. When, or Greg or whatever, it's like, my name is Mr. A. And then you tell people in the, what you've done, and you come back and like, oh, wow, the things you've done is absolutely amazing. So yeah, so yeah, the whole, that whole collection, uh, it's called String Theory, is about um, male mental health. Well, it's about mental health in general, but it's specifically, a lot of, the, a lot of them are general mental health ones, but there's some which is skewed particularly to male, because it's, it's something that's not talked about, really. You know, and also in the black community, there, you know, there's a lot of mental health issues that goes under the radar. Because we got to put, you know, I know I've talked about, you know, you've got to like at war and you've got to put the armor on when you go out into the world. But there's another thing is like, okay, if you're being bombarded all the time, you know, it's going to, it has a, a toll on the body and the mind. I mean, I know somebody, you know, I know somebody who actually died of a broken heart literally died there was they were fine they were seeing somebody they broke they broke up with that person and they just over the years they just faded until they died in like and you know was there anything particularly wrong with them it's just a just a broken heart that's it i also know somebody who's um got um terminal cancer and the doctors say to her like oh well you you've outlasted you know your time you know they say to her like, like a couple of weeks ago they said to her like you know they all the mark indicators they put for when she should be gone she's exceeding them so like, right now they just don't bother saying like oh yeah we reckon you you know it so should be about this month or this month when you're going to be gone she's like we don't they don't bother doing that anymore because she is still going on you know i was speaking to a friend of mine the other day she had a um, she had a brain aneurysm, you know, and they said like, okay, 50-50 chance of survival. Most people, and if you do survive, you know, you will not be, you will not have all your faculties. She survived. You know, this is why you survive. Okay, it's just that her, she, she had the strength of character. And, it's, that's, and that's just strength of character because physically, you know, she wasn't, in a, she wasn't in a great condition beforehand, but you know, now, Talk to her, she's fine. 
The only she has like a slight mark on her arm where they had to put various tubes in. But unless she tells you that she had a brain aneurysm, you wouldn't know. So the you know the power of the mind is very very important. People underestimate it. So that's why I say things like you have to have a personal mission statement. You have to have you know words that you you sell yourself to yourself. Because the brain is one of those things is that you it's fantastic you but you have to tell it what to do. If you tell it what to do, it will zoom in that direction. But if you just like, you know, but if you, you know, and the brain is fantastic, it will look for things to do. You know, it's where it'll drift off and go here, there, and everywhere. But you've got to tell it what to do and it will do it. It'll go there full belt ahead. So yeah, um, there, so that's got sidetracked. So like, so I wrote, um, I've written, as I say, I've written 12 poetry collections about different topics. I wrote one called Wide Awake in Dreamland, which is about most of the time me being the only black guy in the room. So that was what that was, that, that was collection was for my daughter. You know, um, like I said, I wrote one for my son, the first one, and then I wrote one for my daughter, because most of the time I'm trying to explain to her what it's like. Most of the places I go, I've been the only black guy in the room. You know, I went round. <laughs> Loads of places I've been. I used to live in a town of uh, you know ten thousand people, two black families. I was one of them. Everybody knew my business. You know, I've been to um, I've been to you know in the late eighties. I went around traveling around South America. I want to get a haircut in Peru in a small village. They were they were passing my hair around because they'd never seen a black person's hair before. You know, calling everybody in from <laughs> from different houses to pass this stuff around look at this wow <laughs> you know stuff like that and like and other stuff like you know funny stuff and serious stuff what it's like you know okay it, you know they wrote things about imposter syndrome and um, things like that you know all sorts of things i wrote a collection about um i wrote one about grenfell um which has has got a very good response. Um, I've had, I got feedback from, I got somebody contacted me who's a Methodist minister and she liked it so much that she bought copies and sent them to like her fellow ministers who are, you know, in Jerusalem and other places. So, um, so yeah, and then after that, I felt, cause the, right, the Grenfell one was such a, a harrowing, you know, deep dive. You know, when I, when I finished writing that one, it was like, you know, I was in a deep, dark place. So after that, I wrote some funny ones. Well, I perceive them to be funny anyway, so other people might have a different opinion. Um, I wrote one called Extra Sass, which was just, um, I just thought it was full of jokes. My wife just says, it, you just sound angry. I just sound angry. Um, but, uh, you know, I, the way I describe it, it's like if um, Al Murray pub landlord was black, it'd be, <laughs> it was that sort of style. Um, and then I wrote one about being a tax, in, being a tax inspector, being a black tax inspector, because that was a different thing altogether. And that was that was more that was comedy as well. So yeah, I've written a, and also, you know, but through all my books, the the underlying thing is about being black. You know, because I feel that there's not enough. Uh, well, it's just me personally. There, I just saw there was not enough black books that reflected what I want to see. So um, if I didn't see it, what was I supposed to do about it? Write them. That's what I do. So have there been, uh, have there been any of your poems or any of your collections that haven't been uh, well received and any that have kicked up any controversy at all? Well, as I say, I've done uh, 12 uh, collections. There's only one poem that I've had a negative response from. Just one. And that poem was all about uh, black men working for themselves. You know, you know, so if you think about it, there's 12 collections. Most of them have got about 60 to 80 poems in. The only negative I got was one poem was about, and it's all about black men being the determinants of their own futures. And the response was like, and this wasn't from somebody who would say to the say, say like, oh, they're racist. 
but they've just been fed what the, what they're fed from the media. You know, so her response was, "I don't like that one." Uh, you know, it doesn't reflect the black any of the black people I've seen on the telly. So you know, which you can't really argue with, really. You know, because there's you know certain narratives which are not you know, widely seen on the TV. But, you know, from where I'm living and what I see, you know, black people who are entrepreneurs, to me, they're the, they're the most fantastic people because, you know, as I said earlier, we're being bombarded by, you know, what's good hair, what's bad hair. You know, and entrepreneurs have gone, Right, okay, the world is like this. I'm gonna shape my own destiny. I'm gonna shape my own world. So people who do their own thing in their own way, I always have that massive utmost respect for, you know, because you know it's easy to go along with the grain. It's harder to go against the grain. So hard. But then, you know, the other way that the, another way of putting it is yeah, I'm a musician. Do you want to hear? the original, or do you want to hear a cover version? You know, do you want to hear a karaoke version? No, you want to hear the original. So, you know, being your authentic self. And also I've got to add like being, being an entrepreneur, being, um, it's not for everybody. Cause I've met some people, it, you know, it doesn't suit, but I think everybody should um, have, give it a go, even in a small way of being an entrepreneur. And, and by that, when I say entrepreneur, it's a loose term. It's a case of like, okay, ha determining, being, having an income stream, which you decide. Because I tell you, like, I would, as I say, as a careers advisor, as a careers advisor, I'm telling you straight, it is, I found it, so, there's been times where it's, it's been easier for me to fill in an application form to get funding to start to start something than filling in an application form for a job it's less hassle it's less hassle. but some people are scared of paperwork that comes back to schooling i could i could i could i need another two hours to talk about schooling i really could as i say i've, I've been i've written i've written exam um qualifications you know, um, I've also I was also part of um, a forerunner for the Arts Award. I was involved in something called No Offense Intended, and it was a, a project um, because designed to um, look at developing qualifications for ex-offenders. You know, because so and because found like okay, people have been in prison; they got skills, but how do you document it, and why is it worth something? So, and that led on to the Arts Award. So, uh, yeah, I could talk about education all day. <laughs> Any other questions? What, what about your um, mentorship? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Or people who mentored me or me mentoring other people? You mentoring other people. Well, talk about your mentors first and the impact that they had, and then talk about your mentoring. Okay, well, all right, all right. The greatest role model ever for me personally was my godfather. And my godfather, who's sadly no longer with us, his name was Dr. John Roberts QC. And he was the first black judge in the country, in the UK. Now, the reason why he is so fantastic, because he was the first black judge. And I tell you, if you asked me, like when I was younger, how many times I saw him, it was rare because, you know, we lived in London and then my family moved out and he was, you know, being a, a lawyer, he, in, doing international stuff. I, I rarely saw him when I was younger. But the thing is, he existed. He was a real thing, a real person at the, you know, I could call him up. So he was real. So remember, I'm 54. So I grew up in the, you know, 70s, where it's like you've got Alf Garnet on the TV, you know, all that kind of stuff. Love thy neighbor, all that nonsense. 
you know? So when, when I'm being bombarded through the media going like, oh, black people are this, black people are that. I'm going like, actually, what I'm receiving from the TV is not reality. That's just a, that's, that's actually TV. That's just made up stuff. Because what I've seen, you know, I know someone who I don't see him very often, but he's a real person and he's up there. So that's why I say the ceiling is up there. So no matter how tough I think I've got it, I just go like, and I've ever had it, you know, I just go like, well, actually, my godfather went from there to being in the heart of the establishment and at the top. So having the skill to navigate all those ways. That's why I say things seem like, like, okay, what is, what is your outcome? What's your mission statement? What words do you tell yourself? You know, the, pla the, the route you take will change, but you've got to keep your eye on the price at all times, at all times. So yeah, so he's been the number one influence on my life, you know? But you know, everybody's got different things at different times. You know, um, people I've mentored, like I say, I've, I mentored somebody who wonder, she was homeless. And then the, she eventually went on to win the Mercury Music Prize. And I knew she'd win because the route she took, I'm not saying it's because of my, my, my input, but the moves that she made subconsciously or consciously is that the, the record label that was interested in her punched above their weight. The Brook Level's Big Dada. And so they were very focused. They knew, what, they had their mission statement. They knew what they did and how to do it. So it's, you know, the, the, I suppose the equivalent in writing terms is People Tree Press. Because the size of People Tree Press, how big they are, to compare to how many awards their authors win, that's that. So, and then I've mentored people who've been on X Factor. You know, I've mentored somebody who went over, um, who's in the top 10. Um, I went to somebody who went on to win, uh, to get a billion views, but everybody is different and everybody, um, and I, there's a reason why I don't mention names, right? Because first of all, I don't want to take credit for their work. Secondly, the mere fact that when you mentor somebody, right? everybody gets takes the information on board in a different rate so for instance i could say something today to you and you go like oh that's fantastic or you go like ah oh, no 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 but like it could be five years time you go like ah oh, that thing i think that's something to me people said things to me and like years later i've gone like oh that thing yeah so you know everybody's got a different route to learning so for instance, like, you know, my daughter, she says everything I say is rubbish. She's not interested. You know, <laughs> she goes like, why do people want to listen to you, dad? You're not qualified. <laughs> Whilst my son goes like, oh yeah, you're fantastic. <laughs> you know, everybody receives information in a different way and is receptive in different ways. So yeah, I'll work with somebody and, you know, if they, if they choose to mention me, fine. If they choose not to mention me, fine. You know, and that's, a, that's the other thing about the work that um, I do and other people do. It's a case of where do you get your, um, now what, how, what do you view as success? What do you view as the kudos? What do you view as payment? Um, because one thing I have learned, you cannot take thanks to the bank. You can't go, oh, go, yeah, lots of people like me. <laughs> no, to your bank manager, it don't work. Um, um, and there was something else I was going to say. Um, no, it's lost now, it's gone now. Um, yeah, I'm sure it'll come back to me. Um, any other questions? Uh, so I know that you're uh, writing a book at the moment. Can you can you talk to us about that and what you're aiming to do with it? Okay, yeah. So I'm writing a, cr a black British crime novel um, because all the black British crime novels I've seen or read, I'm not happy with them. And if you see something you're not happy with, you put up or you shut up. So, you know, how can I complain if I'm not prepared to 
put what I've done into the public domain. So I'm tired of the stereotype of, oh, oh, it's black people, it's young black people, it's drugs, it's gang violence. It's drugs and gang, gang violence. It's black and black crime. You know, you know, if I wrote that book, you know, and I've got a master's in creative writing, I would have been a millionaire ages ago. Because it's easy to talk out that stuff. Like, oh yeah, guns, knives, guns, knives, guns, knives. And it's like, no, I'm here for, you know, my mission statement is different. I'm bringing a different narrative to the table. So I'm, my thing is still like, okay, black British crime novel, it's got nuances there. You know, good people and bad people, but you know, if you have, if you think somebody's a bad, they have good reasons for doing that thing. And good people who've got, you know, nuance, they've got a bad side to them, just like in real life. But I am aware that as a black writer, black British writer, my stuff doesn't have to be great. It has to be super, super great, great, great just to get through. And that's what I'm planning on doing. And I'm, I'm real close. I'm real close now couple more days it'll be done there'll be a case of sending it out and the thing is you know as i say it's this is a movement it's not a competition so if, the, if i get the door open i'm saying bringing people with me which is why i i put together an anthology of uh, poetry you know it's you know i had like eight other writers in it and it's, you know because with my experience as a teacher going into schools go like okay if a poet goes to a school, what happens? They go, okay, where's your published work? Doesn't matter how good you are. Oh, but I haven't got any. Okay, problem solved. Yeah, I got a load of um, uh, poets, black, black and Asian poets based in the Northeast. I got an editor, got a graphic designer, put a whole thing together, got good reviews, great reviews. And it's out there so that when these poets who are in the collection, approach schools, you know, when they reopen, I want to do work, it's all good. They've got a quality piece, you know, they've got great reviews behind them. And so their profile goes up, you know, I've done my bit, the rest is up to them. There you go, simple. Well, it's not simple, it's, I mean, I've simplified it a bit, but you know, some, everybody's different. Some, some uh, writers, it was a case of like, just send me the stuff, just send me the stuff, it's okay, don't worry about it, just send me the stuff. And I'll let the editor sort it out. It's like, oh, but it's not ready. Yeah, but you've been on, you're on the poem for a year. Come on, time's up. <laughs> and some people, you know, needed a cajoling. Some people just like, oh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, some people were writing about stuff I knew there's an audience for, but traditional publishers would not, would not grab it. So for instance, the first one in there, in the collection, the anthology is, uh, by a woman called Zuva, and it's about her experience with her hair. And you know, if you're a black person and I talk about hair, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about, innit? But if you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> so I heard her perform it live and I just went like, oh, that, the world needs to hear that. So there we go. Super, any questions from our, um, from our other participants at all? Yeah, Kim's putting her hand up there. Yeah, I've got my hand up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> far away. I was just interested in how you um, acquire your mentees. Are you, do you work through it? I know there's an organisation called um, Women Mentoring, Woe Mentoring, that, um, where people put themselves up for mentoring positions. This is particularly for writers. But I'm really interested in your mentoring young um, boys um, or young men so I, I'm just wondering how you acquire your mentees. Is it through an organization or what? Well, some people recommend people to me, okay. right? Or I see something, I just go like, nah, man, that needs, that needs, I, need, I, need this. I need to deal with that. So, like, so for instance, there was, this, uh, there was this guy and he's into, um, I saw he did a post. He was, he was somebody, I think it was a family member. And he was talking of trying to explain, you know, Black Lives Matter to them, you know, because somebody had gone like, you know, white privilege, blah, 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 you know, so he'd gone, yeah. and basically this, this post went on for 30 pages. And I'm just going like, man, that's, you're spending a lot of energy. Just recommend like, 
a book and let's move on. Um, but he went for 30 pages. And then I looked at him and he, I, I checked out his profile. He was a musician. And you know, like, you know, so I was into that. And he was a, a rock musician. I thought, okay, have a listen. And I had a listen to the music and it was, it was quite good, but it was like the vocals were low in the mix. And I was, when I heard the vocals were low in the mix, I go like, oh, that's a confidence thing right there. So I messaged him and I wasn't going to mentor him. I was just messaging him going like, oh yeah, I like your track. And he was going like, um, so then he sent, me a, he sent me a link to something else and all the stuff was low in the mix. I'm just going like, nah. So I'm going like, he's, because he, from, from him doing a 30 page post, I know he's got energy, but his energy is being used up. Mm. So me mentoring him, I just go like, right, okay, this is what you need to do is refocus. And then he had this, and because of the confidence thing, it was like also a case of, right, he, he was, he had this, I don't say obsession, but he was really, he recorded a music with a three piece band. And it had, it was slick, the studio production was slick. And it was like his, his gold standard. But the music he was making by himself, when he was playing all the instruments, it had more life to it. So my, when I, so me working with him, it was just a case of me going like, right, okay, let's refocus. You have X amount of energy, you know. It's just, and I, I, work, I work with some other people, like I don't work with somebody who's got chronic pain. So she can only do things for an hour and a half a day. So on a good day. So I said the same thing, same thing to, to this guy I was working with. I said like, okay, you only have one and a half hours. How would you spend the time? Okay, what are the, let's put some processes together so you can be as creative as possible and get, get yourself into a particular position. Because I know he's got the energy. I know he can, he's got the tools to do the work by himself. It's just a case of refocusing. So I say to him, like, okay, I'm his manager slash mentor, but I, it's, I'm, I'm not any of those. I just give him some advice. And if, if, it, if it time kind of time comes for he needs to, like, negotiate something, I'm there. But, like, I'm, it's weird because, you know, I'm not even... My thing is, like, my mission statement is to improve the lives of Black people. That's it. That's my mission statement. So I'm not even doing it, you know, I'm his manager, but I'm not taking any money. I'm not, I'm not even interested. I'm just interested in people having living the lives that they want to live. And it just so happens that because of my experience and the things I've been through, I have a certain amount of knowledge. So what I, I can either keep that to myself or share it. You know, and I'm, for, I'm in a fortunate position that I can pick and choose the things that I do. And I can adjust things accordingly. So you know, I've done I've done stuff for um, government bodies and had to fill in non-disclosure agreements and paid like you know four figures, you know, for like a day. And I've done stuff where it's just like, okay, you really need the help. I'm here for free. You know, what I mean, it's like I'm fortunate in the position that because I have a certain amount of knowledge that I've gathered, and it, some people are receptive to it. And, it, and it's useful for some people, not useful for others. Yeah. You know, some, I'm, I'm not, you know, some, I work with somebody, they go like, ah, your star's not working for me. I've got, I haven't got a problem with that. You know, cause like, if you ask me what my three words are, you know, you know, what, what are my three words that I have? You know, one is plotting a plan. Uh, cause I've got a plan. I've got a wife and two kids. You know, I can't, you know, as a writer, you know, they just think about plotters and pantsers, people who plot and people who just freestyle. I can't freestyle because I've got to turn around to my wife like, okay, oh yeah, I'm just going to do right for like two, this thing for two years. Oh, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm just going to just throw words at the paper and see what happens. No, I got, I got a plan of plot. So yeah, first word, a plan. Second word, focus. As you can tell, I'm focused. Okay, third word, energy. All right, three, and I got a fourth word which is time sensitive. Because I just think like, you know, because, because I get so into your suspects, I can just go in deep and in there forever. But no, just go like, okay, there's a time limit on this. Like for instance, this is for an hour. We've hit an hour mark. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that has been useful. It hasn't been a bit rambling, go here, there and everywhere, but you know, hey, 
you know, if you've got any questions that, you know, suddenly, just send them to Basil. Basil, send them to me. I'll answer them. Yeah. Send them right back. Facts. That's brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. No problem. Dominic, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for participating today. Um, okay. As always, I, I get a lot from your... <laughs> Well, they're not quite rants, but I, I always <laughs> get a lot from when, whenever you're talking and I'm in the same space as you. So thank you so much, Dominic. You are the man. Uh, I can't thank thanks, you. Thanks, Dominic. Really enjoyed it. Okay, yeah, cool. Super. Yeah. Damien, thanks a lot for coming along. Kim, it was lovely to see you. Um, Ava, uh, Maria, 